intermolecular forces. So what's the big deal here? We've got a looks like a paper clip and a boat. Mari, what's going on with the paper clip? Why isn't why isn't it sinking? It should. It should sink. But it's just it's a static picture. I mean it would just stay there. What the heck? Oh. Surface tension. Yeah, because the surface isn't broken. Very good. The surface isn't broken. That's definitely surface tension. I wouldn't even call that floating. I'd just call that laying on top. Right? It's it hasn't broke the surface tension. Surface tension is a very strange phenomenon. I mean, what's going on in the surface, these molecules are pulled in different directions. Only, only you know, like in a plane they're pulled on, attracting each other. But in the bulk, it's all directions. And they found that if you want to look for some chemical contaminants in the environment, like in lakes and rivers and streams, you sample the, the surface. For some reason, that's where it really hangs out, much more so than in the bulk. That surface tension is a whole other region of the water. It behaves very, very differently. But it's a liquid, so you should picture a gas as a bunch of molecules just flying around really fast, right? Not even sticking together. But a liquid, no, man, they're, they're moving around, but they're, kind of, they're still stuck to each other, right? But they're stuck to each other in a different direction in here. For that paper clip to sink, he actually has to break through the surface, tear apart those molecules so you can fall through. Kind of odd, but he, it's not heavy enough. How about the boat? Victoria, what's going on there? He's definitely broke the surface tension, so the boat's not floating because of surface tension. He's floating because buoyancy, the complicated word for this. Easier word starts with the D. Density. All right. The boat. Right? What's the density of water? One, what are the units though? Grams per, not liter, grams per milliliter. Density of water is one gram per milliliter. If that boat is going to float, its density has to be what? Less than one gram per milliliter. Boats are heavy. That means the darn thing's going to be pretty dang hollow and things to bump up that volume. Likewise on this guy. He's about 50 grams, my little boat. And on the shape is a rectangle. So if you measure length times width times height, divide the 50 grams by that volume, you get a number that's less than 1. It's like 0.92 or something. So he doesn't float very well, but the point is he floats. If I got a number bigger than 1, he's going to sink like a rock. Okay, so two different phenomena going on there. Here's some different surface tensions of some liquids. Why are they different? Randy, why are these different numbers? Look at these guys. 0 0.029, right? 0 0.073 for water. Heat it up and water drops down a little bit. What's going on? Why would they all be different? I mean, they're all liquids. Brandy, they all have a surface tension. Yeah. Temperature, it looks like it has something to do with something. Because look, when you heat it up, the surface tension actually goes down. So that means the interactions are stronger or tougher if you heat it up. Right? Surface tension is back up a little bit. Joules per square meter. What's the joule part? Heat or just in general energy? All forms, joules. How about meters squared? What's that better known as? Not how fast. That has to have time in it. Area. Distance is just m. m squared area. m cubed. Volume, length times width times height. But this is just area. So what surface tension is saying is that it takes energy 
to pull these molecules apart because they're, they're stuck together. So you pull them apart hard enough, give it enough energy, you can actually pull them apart and stuff can fall through. So it looks like if you have a higher surface tension, dang, is it more cohesive forces? Is it stronger up there? Or is it weaker? That's for larger surface tension values. Stronger, right? Yeah, it's, it takes more energy to stretch it so many square meters. So that water at 20, it, yeah, it's, he's got the, the strongest cohesive forces holding those those molecules kind of sucking them up together to make that liquid, to make that layer. You heat it up and it goes down. Why would that be? Yeah, I think you're breaking the kind of more jittery, right? You're weakening that the intermolecular forces there. You're weakening it. Everything's just more energy. They're just vibrating more. It's easier to fall through. So I bet you, you crank up the temperature, they're all going to drop. I bet you that would happen. But Okay. So that's, that's some talk about surface tension versus floating. How about viscosity? Uh, Brandy Cruz, what's viscosity? Got two brandies, you gotta remember that. Where's Brandy Cruz? Brandy Cruz, what is viscosity? You go to Walmart, oh, give me some 10W40 oil, or 5W50. Or, ah, what are, there's a bunch of numbers, right? How fluid it is, right? If something is really like this guy, look how easily he shakes, right? And how easy it is to stir him. This is a really low viscous or very high viscous liquid. Very low viscous, right? If something really viscous is like syrup, right? That's high, very high viscosity. Which, one, which type of oil, Albert, would you want in your car if you lived in Minnesota right now? Would you want a very viscous oil or, or an oil with a very low viscosity? Very low, right? Because it's really cold up there. Things are going to get even more viscous, right? They're not going to have as much energy. So you want as low viscosity oil as possible to put in that engine up, up north. Okay. Pretty much every liquid, and it's kind of weird to think of cement as a liquid, but it really is. It's this big slurry stuff. But cement, water, pretty much everything, if you uh, start stirring it, and you start going faster and faster and faster, does it get easier or harder? Easier, right? Once you get it going, it's even easier, right? It's even easier once you get it going. And cement will really bring that out, because that's really hard to stir. But and that, those are, that's how things should work. I mean, it just makes sense. They call those Newtonian fluids. A non-Newtonian fluid is just the opposite. If I want to st stir this thing fast, it really resists it. I can, it's only easy if I go nice and slow. I can make a non-Newtonian fluid. Cornstarch. I dump some in. Then I dumped in some water. I didn't dump in a lot, but I dumped in enough. And what I want to pass this around, what I want you to see is you're going to grab this thing. You're going to want to stir it because you're so used to working with your whole life Newtonian fluids. You can stir it if you push hard. No, you can't. you got to grab it with your little fingers and stir it and just barely push on it. Or take it and just try to puncture it through it. You can't puncture it through it if you push hard. You have to go nice and slow, and it'll, then you can hit the bottom. So check that out. Now these guys, I'm not sure what country it is, they filled a big bathtub kind of thing with this stuff. I don't know what they're saying, but it's it's a neat video.
he stops moving, he'll sink. But you played with the stuff in the cup, right? What? I don't... I don't know, maybe need to watch more videos or Google this or whatever, but what if the guy actually put his head underneath and the stuff got in his mouth and he swallowed it? Right? Because you can imagine you're... Like, all these muscles moving. They're pushing on it. That thing's going to lock up you. Right? That could be a horrible way. I, it seems like that's what would happen, doesn't it? I don't know. Anyway, maybe it's more dangerous than it looks. Okay, we have intermolecular forces. AJ, can you give me one of them? So we've got these forces that actually hold molecules together. Those are the bonds. Now, we're not talking about those. We're talking about molecule, molecule. Ah, what makes them stick together? There are three of them. You want to give them a hand? Ooh, dipole, dipole's one. I'm going to put it right in the middle. Dipole, dipole. That's one of them. Hydrogen bonding, the strongest. He goes up on top. Oh, good. He knows them all. Then London. Now, London's got several words. They're going to say London. They're going to say dispersion. And there's one more. Van der Waals, name of the, some guy. All of those are the same. They mean the exact same thing. Okay, just what are they? What makes liquids? What makes solids? Right? At least for molecules, anyway. Let me start at the top. Hydrogen bonding. Well, in that molecule, you have to have hydrogen present. Otherwise, this whole thing isn't going to work. Right? 
And then you need oxygen or fluorine. Why? Something really electronegative. Ramiro, what is electronegative? What does that mean? It really what? Yeah, that's you're the more you're, the dudes who are really really close to being noble gas, they're really electronegative, you're right. They want electrons. Exactly. What's the most electronegative element up there? Fluorine. What's the next most electronegative? Oxygen. That's why it's these two. It's just the two most electronegative elements known to man. So you have these guys in the molecule, O and F and H. Well, then they're just going to end up sticking together. Like, think of, uh, I don't know, just draw some funky molecule here. Here, this guy, you have an H hanging out over here, and here you have an O. Well, this, if you have another one, it's going to stick up to it, right? All the O's are going to line up with the H's. And it's not a bond, so you're going to see a lot of this dashed line kind of stuff going on. Oh, they're just kind of, that's the intermolecular attraction going on there. So within a molecule, if you have H with either an O or an F, dang, that's hydrogen bonding. It's the strongest you can get. Dipole, dipole. Last semester, we had to draw these molecules three-dimensionally, Lauren, and Ooh, it doesn't have a dipole moment. It does not have a dipole moment. Remember this? Dipole, dipole is the same as polar. Yes. What does that mean? So this molecule has a dipole. This molecule is polar. That's saying the exact same thing. How can a molecule have a dipole? How can a molecule be polar? What was that? Yeah. Man, all this is really working, right? <laughs> the, uh, maybe it's easier to say what doesn't have a dipole moment. That's kind of easier to say. Or let's pick the most electronegative dudes. Well, F and F. F2. It's the same thing on both sides. Completely nonpolar. So pretty much everything is a dipole as long as they're on opposite sides of the bond, they are different. As long as they're different, they're going to have a dipole moment. Because of what difference? There's the knee. Electronegativity difference. That's why. So as long as they're two different elements, it's going to be polar. And the bigger the difference, right? the bigger the electronegativity difference, the farther apart they are, the more polar. Right? Okay. So really, this hydrogen bonding thing is just a special case of dipole-dipole. It's just super strong, so they just make it a case on its own. But it's dipole-dipole. Okay. Uh, and we'll have some animations for this to show you in a little bit, but then you have this London stuff. What's that? Now, do nonpolar molecules exist? Do nonpolar molecules exist? Yeah, why not, right? Okay, what's, what's an example of one? You could just say the same thing, same element twice. What's that? F2, fluorine, nitrogen, oxygen, all those gases, O2, N2. Or one of those that we drew three dimensionally, like uh, if you remember doing this kind of thing. Boom, boom. And he had, I don't know, chlorine everywhere. Right? Perfectly symmetric, nonpolar. Okay. These all these compounds, can they be a solid? Can they be a liquid? Yeah, why not? But something has to be causing them to stick together then. And it can't be hydrogen bonding. It can't be dipole dipole. It's got to be dispersion, van der Waals. So it what is it? To me, it's the same thing as what's going to be happening under your bed in about a month, maybe. You, you, assuming you just moved into the dorms, so it, there's no dust under there right now, right? You look under there in a month, 
you start seeing little what bunnies? Little dust bunnies. What does that even make sense? It's dust. Why would dust start gathering up into a little ball? And the ball keeps getting bigger, <laughs> right? Why? Because that's nature. S stuff sticks to stuff. Now it's weak. That dust bunny is very easy to pull apart. But that's the point. Dust, stuff sticks to stuff. Big stuff like dust or little microscopic stuff like molecules, they'll stick together. Really weak, but that's London, or dispersion forces. So all these nonpolar molecules, you bet, you can make them a liquid or a solid, but it's, they're going to be held together really weakly. Okay. So how can we increase all of these? If you have this dispersion force going, and you can't stop it, you're always going to have dispersion forces going on, because stuff is stuff. But it's weak. How could you enhance London forces? Oh, this molecule has more London forces than this one. How can you make that statement? Molecular weight. Bigger, fatter, more surface area, right? But essentially, just molecular weight, I think, is the best way to go. Right? How about dipole-dipole forces? Oh, this molecule has stronger dipole-dipole forces than this molecule. How can you say that? How far they are apart on the periodic table. So like OF or SIF, two bonds, OF. SIF. I look at those two, I see, oh, they're not identical. That means they're polar. Which one's more polar? SIF. Bigger electronegativity difference. Right. O's right next to F, so it's. Okay. You mean like, what do you mean like the same? Yeah, like FF? What do you mean two? Oh, I'm just saying, for so you could put this SIF thing, you could put them in an area like this, right? Or he'd just be an SIF molecule flying around. Or he could be in one of these three-dimensional shapes like that. So I'm just looking at, at the individual bonds themselves. Like one atom bond bonded to another atom. And is it polar? But otherwise, you're right. You're going to have to look at the bigger picture and see what the molecular shape is to see if there's an overall dipole moment or not. Okay. So just make things more polar, right? Or uh, better is how Jasmine said it. Bigger. What difference? Start with an E. Electronegativity difference. Bigger electronegativity. How about hydrogen bonding? You have a molecule. It's got hydrogen and maybe some oxygen atom. And it's got a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom. How could you enhance it and say, oh, there's more hydrogen bonding in this molecule than there is in that molecule? Is that even possible? It's the strongest one. But can you have more hydrogen bonding? Or if you have it, you're done. What's that? Well, what I'm getting at is, why not just have more O's and more H's? Then there's more spots for to do hydrogen bonding. That's all. That's the only way to enhance hydrogen bonding. Is just you have to have more O's and more H's in that darn molecule. And then you can enhance it. That's about the only way. Okay. So the homework might not be worded this way. The homework might say, here's HCl in this part A. Identify the intermolecular force. So they're trying to draw it out and give you some hints here. 
but essentially, I think in the homework, it might just say, you have HCl. Liquid HCl exists. Gaseous HCl exists. Solid HCl exists. What's the intermolecular force in that compound? Uh, Alyssa, what would you say? We have three possibilities here. Dipole, dipole. Does everybody agree? What else could it be? It can't be hydrogen bonding. There's no... You need, you have the H, but you don't have the O or F. So dipole, dipole works. But what, you can't, and you can't stop this one, dispersion, but it's not as important. So they, the book may not even list dispersion because dipole, dipole is so much stronger. Even though stuff attracts stuff, you can't stop it. Dipole, dipole is so important that that's what they're going to say. Okay. Um, how about in B? Yes. Oh, it, dispersion, it will always be, dispersion will, is always an answer. However, it's not going to affect the strength because it's so weak in comparison to dipole, dipole. So that's why they may not even list it. But I don't know if the book is doing an okay job, they, they would list it. And uh, B. How about B, Eric? What type of intermolecular force is a, that's H2O. It's what? Hydrogen, Hydrogen bonding. Yep. How about C? C is kind of a trick question, but maybe Cassandra can get it. London? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to guess. But it came out of... Uh, I'd put that up there because it's kind of a gross story. These little geckos, they walk on glass. And they, and they did. They used to think it was London forces. But then they dissected the little guy's feet, right? I just think how painful this has to be because the thing has to be alive when you're doing all this. And they found a, an abundance of water molecules. and that There's some, something going on there that's kind of spongy, watery-like. So they don't think it's Van der Waals anymore. They think it's hydrogen bonding. And because there's a lot of, on glass, there's a lot of OH groups. So that's what they think is going on. And hydrogen bonding is a lot stronger, too, to hold up that big, heavy lizard. So. Hmm? I think it's a gecko. Gecko. But before we go on to the next one, which one of these gives the highest boiling point? What type of intermolecular force? What would give the highest boiling point? Maybe the hydrogen bonding one. Which type would give the weakest, the lowest surface tension? Van der Waals, right? Okay, because it's the weakest force. If you, if you can follow that, then you see, what's, you see what's going on. Here's some heats of vaporization of certain liquids. Liquid chlorine. 20.4, hydrogen's 0.9, nitrogen's 5.6. Are they what you would expect? Now, before we ask Vanessa, Vanessa, what is the algebraic symbol for heat of vaporization? In all the homework and everywhere, they never say that. They just give a little symbol. What symbol are they giving? The delta. Keep going. It's the delta. H, VAP. That's it. That's what they're talking about, that delta H VAP. Okay, so it's 20.4, 0.9, and 5.6 for these different compounds. Is it what you would expect? So, Maria, it's biggest for liquid chlorine, smallest for liquid hydrogen. Does it make sense? Where's Maria? Maria? Why would liquid chlorine be the biggest and liquid hydrogen the smallest? <coughs> Enthalpy of vaporization. Mass. 
molar mass. Why is molar mass the key? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Molar mass is the key. Mol molar mass is why is what you're supposed to look at. But molar, but molar mass corresponds to what type of intermolecular force? Corresponds to which of the three? Van der Waals. So that's where it's supposed to start. You're supposed to recognize, oh, Van der Waals is the intermolecular force interacting here. It's the only one. Therefore, you go by molecular weight. But why is Van der Waals the only one interacting? Why is Van der Waals the only force there? Intermolecular force, force between molecules. Well, that's yeah, easy to break, but how? It's what? Well, the only trick that I can anyone see it? It's N2, N and N. It's H and H. It's Cl and Cl. All of these molecules are what? They're all, do they have, are they polar? No, they're all nonpolar. If it's nonpolar, your only, only choice is this guy. That's what they want you to go by. If something's nonpolar, this is all you have to work with. That's it. And if this is all you have to work with, then you have to go by size. And then molar mass works, right? Chlorine, man, that's like 70 grams per mole, right? Hydrogen is only two. Nitrogen is, what, like 28? So it makes sense then, okay? We have to identify first that all those are nonpolar. Okay, how about number two? Monica Lopez, we've got Oxygen, liquid oxygen, 6.8 for enthalpy of vaporization. Liquid neon, 1.8. Liquid methanol, 34.5. Do those numbers make sense to you? Like, why would liquid methanol be so big? Liquid oxygen in the middle. Neon hanging out the bottom. But the, the question is what type of bonds? That's what you have to go by. Which one is hydrogen bonding? CH3OH. So pretty much you have to look at each one of these and, and identify the type of intermolecular force. And then you go by the little scale and say, oh, he's the strongest, so he should definitely Right, that liquid methanol, H bonding, dang, he's, that's the strongest type of intermolecular force. So he better, he's going to have the highest boiling points. He's going to have the strongest surface tensions. He's going to have the biggest enthalpy of vaporization. It makes sense. What about the other two, though? Anybody see that? what's going on there? They're nonpolar, so it has to be London. So which one's bigger? Which one has more mass? O2, that's 32. What's neon? Neon is only like 21 or so, right? So Van der Waals is what's going on there. Um, arrange the following substances in order of increasing magnitude of London forces. So from increasing magnitude of London forces, they could have said in order of increasing boiling point. They could have said in order of increasing surface tension. Increasing enthalpy of vaporization. They just want to get get down to what's really going on. Increasing London forces. Which one would be the the weakest? This, this 
Let's see. Because the only thing that matters is that is what. Right? Because it's it's only London forces. The CL4 part's the same all the time. So all you're looking at is the SI, the C, and the GE. And it's London forces. So you're supposed to be thinking what? Molecular weight. Not electronegativity. You're supposed to be thinking molar mass. Because this is London forces. And that's all they're asking about. All right? That's all they're asking about. So the, the lightest one should go first or last? First. The lightest one is, let's see. yeah, it's C. Yeah, C would be the first one. And then it would be SI, S, S, yeah. OK. How about this one? We have BRCL, IBR, BRF, and CLF. Which compound is expected to have the lowest boiling point? The lowest boiling point out of those four. Some are not really the answer, but what's the game plan? What are you supposed to look at? The forces. Identify the type of force. Well, I don't know. Just identify the type of force. London is always there. But if you can pick out hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole, you have to go by it because they're just more powerful. Because London's always there, and it's just super weak. Oh, we never showed our little animations. We have to do that. What's that? Would we, go, would we, be, would we be going by dipole-dipole? Yeah. You have to go by dipole-dipole. So which one would have the lowest boiling point then? Hmm. So you'd want the ones that are what? The closest? Furthest would be the strongest with the really polar held together. So you want the ones that are the closest together, right? So like this one that BRF, you know, they're se definitely not him, because look, they're even separated, right? And really anything with that darn F. Because even the CLF, you still have F in there, right? I'd pick that bottom one, that IBR, because they, there's no F in there. It's about it's as good as you can get. This is to be for being similar. Okay. Let's see, before we, oh, can we do this one, and then we'll I'll show you my quick little animations, and we'll call it a day. List the following substances in order of increasing boiling point. Now, to do this, <coughs> so these there's four molecules there. The white spheres are hydrogen atoms. The little light blue guys are carbon, and the red spheres are oxygen. List them in order of increasing boiling point. Out of all those up there, Jessica, which one is has the lowest, the most weakly held, the lowest boiling point? You'd say which one? Everybody agree? Lowest boiling point. All he has is what type of force? Dispersion. All he has is dispersion. All right. So D. Then everybody, you'd say what would be next? B. Yeah, B would be next because again, there's all you have is dispersion, but there's more because there's more mass now. Then you'd pick A. Why would you pick A and then C? Two more, two more hydrogen bonds. You're not supposed to think of size. 
you're supposed to think of the number of hydrogen bonding spots. So you pick A and then C last, because C has two hydrogen bonding spots. Okay. Now my little animations that I forgot to show. Let's see. Bonds between atoms with different electronegativities have a permanent dipole, that is, a separation of charges, because of the unequal sharing of electrons. Some molecules which contain polar bonds do not have a net dipole. For example, carbon tetrachloride has polar carbon chloride bonds, but the polarities cancel as a result of its symmetrical structure. It is therefore a nonpolar molecule. Even though the chloroform molecule has a tetrahedral shape, one of the outer atoms is different from the others, so the molecule is not symmetrical. See, so now this molecule is now what? Polar, right? Because now you have all those tugs that you guys are talking about, now they're not all canceled out. This guy's different. So that would have dipole dipole. This means the bond dipoles do not cancel, and the molecule has an overall dipole moment. It is polar. Molecules such as sulfur dioxide have asymmetrical structures. What shape did we call him? Bent. He's got these lone pairs up here that are pushing stuff down. Right. Due to one or more unshared pairs of electrons on the central atom. So the point is, is that he has a dipole moment. He's polar because they're not going to cancel out. Right? They're going in different. If they would have been linear, they would have canceled out. And one more here. Okay, this one. Now, what's going on here is you ever. Hardly anyone uses it, but it's really neat stuff. Dry ice. You can only buy it at HEB Marketplace, I think. It's just frozen carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is a linear molecule if you do the Lewis dot structure. It's not that this is, but it's nonpolar. But yet it sticks together. So what they're saying is happening here is that, again, we don't, there's no book that gives all the answers for everything. We don't know. Our answers might change is what I'm trying to say. They, what they think is happening is that at instantaneous moments in time that more electrons hanging out on one end than the other end. So that makes this partially negative and this partially positive. And that's only instantaneous. It happens for like a femtosecond very brief period in time. But enough time so that, ooh, then he's going to stimulate this one. And they're going to kind of stick together a little bit, very weakly because it's so short. And they call this instantaneous dipoles. And that's how they think London dispersion works. But, so have a good weekend.